South, said the captain. But, said his crew, there simply aren't any directions out here in space. When you travel on down toward the sun, replied the captain, and everything gets yellow and warm and lazy, then you're going in one direction only. He shut his eyes and thought about the smoldering, warm, faraway lands, his breath moving gently in his mouth. South, he nodded slowly to himself. South. That's an excerpt, the opening lines, I guess, of um, Ray Bradbury's short story, The Golden Apples of the Sun. And it deals with relative positions. I'm currently here in Canada suffering from a snap of extreme cold weather. <clears throat> and if I want to avail myself of warmth, I go south. I head towards the equator. But south is a relative position. It just assumes that north and south phenomenally exist and that north exists on the North Pole and south exists on the South Pole. But the problem is, of course, if you're on the South Pole, the only possible direction to go is north. And if you're on the North Pole, the only possible direction to go is south. These are just arbitrary um, terms that we've come up with, or I shouldn't say they're arbitrary, but they're based upon an artifact, and that is the axis of the Earth's rotation. That's not something that exists in the universe. The Earth's rotation and its axis only exist <coughs> in a sort of terra-centric view of the universe. Um, so in a sense, you're not moving north or south at all. You're only moving north and south relative to an established artifact that you have decided are north and south. If you're, you know, for example, if you're um, just out in the void of space, what direction are you going to use as north and south? It's kind of interesting the way that science fiction works. When you see ships out in space, <coughs> uh, ships generally, spaceships as we see them, generally have an up and a down on them. Not all of them, but generally they do. You know, in Star Trek, you see two ships that obviously have a clear top and bottom of their ships facing each other. Why would they choose that kind of, you know, means of determining what's up and what's down? Why wouldn't they meet sort of like this and say, look, we're, we're on the right axis, you're on the wrong axis over there. We're actually up and down, you're not. Um, you know, I'm sure that's occurred to a lot of people watching science fiction. Especially science fiction that's more allegorical than trying to really deal with the issues behind space travel and things like that. Um, like, say, Star Trek or something. Um, but what direction is what? Well, we decide in advance what our anchor is going to be. Then we go from there. It doesn't mean that we have established that north and south exist in the universe as a coherent term. Now, that's just one example, north and south, up and down, as I said in my case of, case of spaceships. What's up and what's down? Who decides? Where do you plant your anchor? Where do you drop your anchor and say, this is north and this is south? It's the same thing with identity. Um, you have to make certain assumptions before you can go any further with our logical system. And otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. But, well, that's... Okay, is that a reflection on our system of logic or is it a reflection on the underlying reality? I don't think it has anything to do with the underlying reality that is assumed in the three cardinal or the three classic rules of logic. Identity, the excluded middle, and uh, non-contradiction. These are sort of fetters that we put on reality in order to make our logical system work. It's not the other way around. It's not reality has these things uh, uh, phenomenally or absolutely. Uh, we are actually imposing things like identity, the excluded middle, and non-contradiction onto reality to make it work. <clears throat> so, a lot of people have, and, and I understand this, a lot of people have an enormous amount of difficulty wrapping their heads around this, or even if they can wrap their heads around it, it just looks so disorienting and so bizarre that you sort of instinctively recoil from it, kind of in disgust. It's like that old... Um, I think it was either the Outer Limits or Twilight Zone episode from the 1950s where um, it was replicated, I think, in The Simpsons and in a few other sitcoms or whatever uh, bits of pop humor. 
where this kid discovered or fell through a warp in the in the I wouldn't say space time continuum, but the space continuum. And he's gone through a wall in their suburban house and he's now in a place where the normal laws of physics or at least the normal laws of space do not apply non euclidean geometry or something like that um, <clears throat> how do you make sense out of that <clears throat> well i don't think that i don't think you can make sense of it provided you're dealing with the situation in the context of the western system of logic there are other systems of logic out there Indian and Chinese logic are not exactly the same thing as Western logic, uh, especially the type of logic that I use. <coughs> it's called, well, it's just called the Jain system of logic. It tends to deal with shifting points of view and seeing everything from every conceivable point of view and every conceivable set of axioms, starting points. Um, it doesn't say that it is absolute, and Heiveladeh actually raised a very good question. Um, should we apply perspectivism to perspectivism itself? Yes, we should. Um, it, it's, not, it's not saying that there, are, there is no possible correct view of reality. It just says that there may not be one possible way to perceive reality. Um, reality seems to be real. Okay, I'm sort of going to take that as more or less based on my experience of reality. It seems to be so, something seems to be happening out there, quote unquote. You know, um, regardless of whether or not it looks like what I'm talking is solipsism, it's not. I'm just saying that whatever is happening exterior to myself is something that we can only agree upon, but it, we may not actually have encapsulated what reality actually is. And not only that, we're dealing with things like language, which, uh, it, which are inherently flawed. We're dealing with all kinds of assumptions uh, that up and down exist, that uh, A is A and all that sort of thing. There's so many presuppositions in there before you even start to use logic that you don't even notice them. Um, Apex Troll pointed this out in comment in my video. They're just so abundantly obvious in our minds that you don't question them, or you don't even think to question them. Well, there are systems of logic that do think to at least question them. As I said, Jain logic or Indian logic, using Anikantavada, Syadvada, and you know the, the third one, Nyavada, uh, which is partial standpoints. So the Anakantavada says there's a, any number of uh, different points of view to things. Uh, Syadvada uh, says that there are um, there's a sevenfold theory of uh, maybe there's a sevenfold theory of in some ways etc. Um, in other words, you apply this sort of litmus test to any given postulate, and what you what you end up with is a bunch of uh, predicated positions. You end up with a bunch of conditional positions. And the interesting and the interesting one is uh, Nyavada, which says within the realm of utility, we can make certain assumptions. Within the realm of utility, we say a car is not an ostrich. Within the realm of utility, because we have certain assumptions. We want to make sense of the world around us, so we're putting certain assumptions on top of um, things that we wish to talk about. But this is a provisional um, use of identity. Nyavada says, in terms of the discussion that we're having, an ostrich is not a Cadillac. Only in terms of the discussion we're trying to have, though. Western logic seems to take that statement of a car is not an ostrich and engrave it, as it were, in stone. Jane logic doesn't do that. It says, we've got to remember that only within the context of what we're talking about does North and South exist. Only within the context of what we're trying to establish is an ostrich, not a Cadillac. Um, 
<clears throat> How is an ostrich a Cadillac, you may ask? Okay, what's the difference between them in terms of the brute laws of physics? They're all just an agglomeration of molecules. Matter, energy, empty space, that's it. That's all they are. So in that sense, there really is no difference between uh, an ostrich and a Cadillac. They're the same thing. All they are is a mass of matter, energy, and empty space. What's the difference? What if our what if our senses were not equipped to see anything other than matter, energy, and an absence, i.e., empty space? We, if we looked at a, a Cadillac and we looked at an ostrich, we would see the same thing. We might see a different, slightly different configuration, but again, configurations. This assumes that we're our senses are equipped to notice configurations. What if they're not noticed to recognize configurations? What if configuration-ness is simply a category that we've placed on things to help us make sense out of things? In other words, try and live your life in, you know, contemporary, you know, sort of a utilitarian, or a, I shouldn't say utilitarian, but in a, in a way that deals with pragmatism. Try and live your life assuming that there's no difference between an ostrich and a Cadillac. Well, good luck. I suppose you could do that if you put yourself in an isolation tank for the rest of your life, but <clears throat> if for the purposes of walking down the street and uh, not bumping into a signpost, you have to assume that there's a signpost in front of you, even though you can sort of think your way into a way of thinking that there is no signpost there, because signpostness is something that we've imposed upon that signpost, <laughs> that sort of configuration of molecules, uh, etc., and even configurationness is something that we have imposed upon it. Configurationness doesn't even exist either. Phenomenally, how how can you demonstrate it? Does does a, uh, each of the atoms understand that it's part of a, a configuration? No. You need an intelligence to make sense out of that and to impose a configuration on it. You can say because there's a configuration here and there isn't a, there isn't a similar arrangement there. Therefore, configurationness actually exists. No, it doesn't, <laughs> because you're just sort of placing configurationness on there. I'm starting to get animated again and starting to giggle again. I better watch that because that tends to irritate people. Uh, I'm actually, believe it or not, making a serious point here. Um, how do you how do you deal with that? Well, it depends on the presuppositions and the purpose uh, that you want to set to assuming configurations of matter and energy create an identity, create a thing. You want to be able to deal with what's outside of you. You want to be able to cope with it. So even though it is artificial in a sense, it seems to hold when you assume that an ostrich is not a Cadillac. But again, you're assuming that a configuration actually exists, that the whole concept of configurationness exists. You're assuming that the whole concept of patternness exists. Um, you're even assuming, I suppose, that atoms exist. And you know, the, the deeper we get into physics, the more problematic that becomes in energy and in relativity and all that sort of thing. But again, the objection is continually raised. How can you possibly make any progress if you assume this? Well, remember. It's not an absolute. Heidelade says, would you then say that you're making an absolute statement by using Syadvada, the sevenfold theory of maybe? Well, you are and you aren't. Because, again, the sevenfold theory of maybe says, in some ways, a Cadillac is an ostrich. In some ways, they are two separate things. In some ways, they are both. And in some ways, they are both and neither. And in, in some ways, you simply can't talk about it anymore because when you, when you try and talk about it, you're assuming that your language is capable of talking about it. But by the same token, you still want to exist in the world. So you have to, for the sake of pragmatism, make certain assumptions. And again, Western logic places these assumptions as absolutes. Jain logic does not, or perspectivism does not do this. Now remember, it doesn't say that we're not establishing here the idea that all points of view are equally valid as depictions of reality. What you're doing is you're saying in some ways 
an ostrich is a Cadillac. <clears throat> Only in some ways, and for the purposes of living your life, you will almost never make that assumption. But almost never is not the same thing as never ever. And that, I think, is simply is, is the main difference between Indian and Western logic. Indian logic does not require an absolute anchor. And I have to have emphasize something. Anakantavada, Syadvada, and Nayavada are not doctrines. They are tools. This is very important because they in and of themselves are tools just as much as identity is. I'm not trying... There's an enormous temptation to try and use Anakantavada itself as an anchor or perspectivism itself as an anchor. And this is where you get accused of being deliberately slippery and everything, because people honestly assume that that's what you're doing. I'm not trying to do that. Um, you're either you, you're going to have to accept that or not. If you think that I'm just playing games, don't watch any more of my videos. If you're going to attack my motives, go right ahead. Um, but all you're doing is that. Um, I think that these tools should be what is being criticized here and I would just love to get into a debate with somebody who wants to refute these tools because these how do you refute something that is simply a tool um, they're just ways of encapsulating a reality or encapsulating a common view of reality that doesn't exclude everything else um, <clears throat> when you exclude things you are excluding a perspective as well that may actually, in certain contexts, be valid. Now, Anakantavada is not, or all these tools are not things that are designed to deliberately muddy the waters. Well, I suppose you can accuse people of that if you want, but the way I use them is I use them to try and make sense out of reality, out of the world around me, out of my own existence, to try and grasp things <clears throat> and again knowing that you don't know something absolutely is better than not knowing something absolutely and thinking you do again we go back to Socrates and the Delphic Oracle Socrates was deemed to be the wisest among men because he alone among men knew nothing and knew that he knew nothing now, just because you know nothing, it doesn't mean that you, you haven't learned a great deal about how to operate in this existence. But have you actually established any fundamental truths? You can say, okay, you, you, want, you want to say that, say, for example, fire doesn't exist. Okay, well, I'll thrust a torch into your face and see how you feel about that. All right, all that you've done is you've established that um, in certain ways, fire bloody well does exist because you'll see the cell damage and you'll see me screaming my head off in pain when that happens. But really, have you really demonstrated anything's existence in any fundamental sense? No, you haven't. You haven't at all. You haven't told me what fire actually is. You haven't told me what its ultimate rock-bottom nature is. Fire is a reaction, you know, um, fire is a release of energy. What's energy? What does a release mean? But that doesn't mean that I'm going to ignore the fact that somebody is coming at me with a red-hot poker wanting to put it somewhere strategically in my body. Um, it, the, things that I'm, the, the tools that I'm using here and that I'm explaining when it comes to, say, conditional predications and things like that, I'm not trying to say that reality doesn't exist. That's hard to get through that, th that point through to people because there's just so much evidence that it does exist and people are so used to thinking that non-contradiction and all this sort of thing as opposed to looking at it from different perspectives all the time. This is something that you have to actually train your mind to do. Um, you can't you can't just wake up one morning. Well, I suppose some people could, but you know, just suddenly start looking at every conceivable angle of everything. I often use the example of cubism. 
um, Cubist art. A lot of people are confused by it. They have no idea what it all means. But cubism is an attempt to paint three dimensions in two. That's all. Um, it, it just assumes that like, our assumption is that you can't see things in two dimensions because things are three. But cubism is trying to portray the third dimension, which our eyes really aren't equipped to do. Uh, that's, you know, stereoscopic vision kind of allows us to see from two perspectives at the same time and get depth perception and things like that. But cubism is aimed at, instead of t looking at things from two perspectives at once, which is essentially what our eyes do when you have stereoscopic vision, you are looking at things from two points of view at once. That cubism says, look at everything from one point of view at once, but you're seeing all of it. Um, most people's minds, I assume, just spit that out. I uh, say, so that's impossible. My, I'm not equipped to do that. You might not be equipped to that to do that right now, but you can learn how to do it um, if you want to. If you want to see every conceivable point of view uh, in real time, whenever you want to, it's not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. Now, this is an interesting way where... Um, you have to actually build a technique to put your own philosophy into actual practice in real life because you're dealing with the experiential, aren't you? Um, perspectivism is, if you ask me, almost exclusively experiential. You can get dialectical about it, of course, in the ways that I debate things, but ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to experience things as close to what they actually are as possible. You're trying to see see things like, okay, I understand that everybody is disagreeing over everything, and there must be a reason why they're disagreeing. So what is that reason? I want to see everybody's point of view at once and find out why they believe or they see things the way that they see them all the time and in real time. Not an easy thing to do, but I seem to have at least made some progress in terms of trying to see things that way. Um... And, and the only objections I ever come up with is, A, I'm behaving in a sneaky way deliberately, or B, watch what happens when I hit you in the face with a bludgeon. You're going to say that that bludgeon exists. Of course I am. But also, in a sense, I also understand that it doesn't really exist in any different sense than I do. You're not trying to disprove anything in as much as you're just trying to see things from every possible point of view and if possible or if necessary to avoid absolutes that's all that I'm doing here it's not that I'm trying to say A is not A and I've made a whole bunch of videos about it, about this before I've said if A is then A is A but A is A has the assumption of A-ness in it, it says that A-ness already exists. This is kind of a difficult one to talk about. It's kind of a Freudian tongue twister here. But <clears throat> if you say A is A, then you're, before you even say it, you're presupposing A. Anaconda Vada and all these other tools are trying to back up from that and trying, to, and trying not to build the assumption in there, into that statement. 